I have talked before about uh, the term millennial. Uh, millennial Christians is a category which uh, people like me who write publicly love to use. Um, in fact, everyone seems to love to use it. It sells a lot of books these days to, to write to millennial Christians, to talk about what they think, uh, how they view the world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you're not such a fan, I gather, of the category. <laughs> Is that right? And uh, why? I'm curious to hear in full your worries, your objections, your thoughts about what's going on when we're using millennial Christian. It's not, it's not that I have a special um, grievance on uh, millennials. It's it, millennials and generational analysis um, on a larger scale, not just, for instance, with regard to boomers. Right, and, or Gen X. Or, yeah, any of those, any of those, uh, that they, they have a certain limited utility as long as you realize that they are a fiction. In right. other words, there's no such thing as a millennial. Right. <laughs> you can't walk down the street and say, oh, look, there, there, there's a millennial. Um, but my tattoo might give me away as being one. It's a, it's, a, um, it, it's a heuristic device. And if you use it in a very limited way, it, it can be useful. But unfortunately, most of the time when people use the term, they actually act as if it's talking about something like... Uh, there's a um, member of the San Francisco 49ers, or you know, right. so that it's something more than a heuristic that they've actually um, identified a member of a class, as it were. Well, and that, and, and all kinds of other assumptions follow follow from that. And one of the things about people who use this kind of analysis is that um, it's a little bit like arguing with an old style Freudian. You know, you can't. <laughs> They can't be refuted because if you point out all kinds of of of, uh, of exceptions, right. you point out ways that there are all kinds of things happening that don't fit with that. Um, they'll say something like, "Well, we're talking in terms of broad generalization." And, yeah, yeah. And, and um, uh, so, you know, honestly, I think that the vast majority of the time the term is deployed now, um, it it uh, is misleading. But there are times when it can be used very usefully. So it sounds like your, your underlying worry, your real concern, is that there's a, a kind of intellectual temperament, um, maybe a vice, to, to use that, um, that, is, that stands beneath its use. Um, would, you, would you go that far to say that we're using it uncritically, unreflectively, that um, it's getting in the way of uh, real substantive analysis of the world is it? Is oh, it? absolutely! I I have no. Yeah, that's you're not putting words in my mouth. <laughs> I've had, no, I completely agree with that, and I see it. I know you and I. Um, most of our uh, of our interaction has either been by by email or or by Twitter, and in fact, this is the first time we've actually had a chance to be in Sit the down, same place right. at the same time, which I'm very thankful for. But. But I see it all the time on Twitter. I see people citing articles in which they say, millennials want this, you know. And um, it, it suggests that there is a certain um, discrete group of right. people who were born between certain years that it's meaningful to say, as a group, they, um, they want this. Right. And um, it also lends itself to... Um, all kinds of uh, um, sloppy thinking that um, is based on those generalizations. So, yes. So, as a as a heuristic, I mean, and as a as a mentality, do you think that it's motivated or exacerbated by? Um, I mean, what do you what do you think is the underlying cause of it? Uh, why why do you think that we are so quick or so eager? Total depravity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you want to run to total depravity as an explanation for all of our vices, sure. But do you think that this kind of um, intellectual vice is particular to our uh, environment, our our social environment? Is there a reason why we like these kinds of rough and ready? Uh, heuristic devices, generational analysis today? 
<laughs> one reason one reason would have to do with the uh, the prestige of a certain kind of pseudoscience, okay. which you see epitomized with uh, the Barna Group. Um, uh, some time ago, I reviewed one of uh, Barna's books in which uh, he was talking about church services. And um, he was giving, uh, you know, our studies have shown that the optimum time, you know, for a sermon is, you know, like 12 minutes or something like that, <laughs> and that people, people actually... Uh, Stop go, listening. Go yeah, and he had gone on with some other things like that. But then you could tell that there was a point as he was writing the book when he said, uh-oh, you know, someone's going to say, you're leaving out the Holy Spirit. I've got to figure out a way to get the Holy Spirit in there. And so he says, um, this does not mean, however, that uh, um, everything is planned down to the second. And in fact, in really uh, effective churches, um, people aren't exactly sure when the service is going to end. You know, they don't know for sure when it's going to end. Hmm. And so I wrote a um, piece about that book in which I played on the similarity between the name P.T. Barnum and George Barna. Uh -huh. And I said that everyone, like you, like me, who's gone to church all their life, knows that if there's one thing you can generalize about churches of all different kinds, you know, they're very different kinds of churches, yep. they have different worship styles, have, it is that everybody involved knows 99 times out of 100 when the service is going to end. Right. It's just the way it is. And I said, if they, if Barna has any evidence to the contrary, yep. that these more effective churches depart from that rule, you know, let him show it. Well, of course, no evidence ever, ever appeared. And so, uh, despite this kind of um, pseudoscience, Barna is an enormously influential figure in the world of American evangelicalism. He's quoted all yep. the time. Um, and I would say that part of the reason that the, um, uh, the notion of millennials and related generational terms has, has, uh, has gotten so much um, uh, credence yeah. is, is, is that, um, that pseudoscientific appeal. So if it's, if it's an intellectual vice to lean too heavily on, to, to unreflectively, lean on these kinds of heuristics for our analysis of the world. Um, I'm curious what you would say about the corresponding virtue. Um, how do you think that we ought, as Christians, counteract, oppose, um, uh, lean against that kind of analysis, other than by just not deploying it ourselves? Are there uh, particular critical virtues that you think we're lacking as those who think about the world that we really need to inculcate within ourselves? Absolutely. I think an attentiveness to um, particularity, um, to, uh, I, lo I love the phrase, the resistance of the real. Hmm. Um, the re uh, okay, the resistance of the real? The resistance of the real. Is an evocative phrase that I want to hear unpack. Well, um, when we're talking about um, issues of uh, looking at the current the current generation, right. which is what all this talk. About. What are they doing? What do they want? What do, well, we we want to be attentive to the messy particulars of that. We don't want to jump prematurely to a narrative that then allows us to spin off uh, an endless uh, series of books and seminars and so on about you know this is what millennials want and and. Just as that loses steam, we come up with some other shtick that we then shift to seamlessly. Right. Uh, just about the time it becomes clear that our generalizations about millennials were at least uh, three quarters baloney, you know. But meanwhile, we're on to something new, and um, so that yes, there are things that we can we can do, um, but but. Uh, and a lot of them are very simple. Again, uh, a, a sense of intellectual modesty, uh, a sense of absurdity, a recognition that um, 
there's a lot that we don't understand and probably never will understand, which shouldn't in any way, again, uh, um, become an excuse for, for uh, uh, giving up our uh, God-given quest to, to know, to right. understand, to learn. Um, but it has to be held in tension with that. Yeah. I don't think that I've ever heard anyone describe uh, a sense of absurdity as an intellectual virtue. Um, though I can see when you say it, uh, how it might be. It's not quite a handbrake turn, but it might be close. Uh, when you talk about a sense of the absurd, it seems like a short step from there toward actually calling certain positions absurd, um, uh. to naming them as absurd. And that's the kind of rhetorical move that is not necessarily in vogue in certain circles and maybe over deployed in other circles. Uh, do you think that's a, a worry about having a sense of the absurd that we would too readily name an absurd being a kind of it functions within your the way that you said it as a kind of positive sense in one sense but to name something as absurd has a kind of um, judgmental well, that's interesting. view. That's interesting I see what you're saying I you know in my own uh, in my own experience uh, those two are not connected um, uh, I'll give you another example. Um, there are tons and tons of books about the problem of evil. Um, I have tried to persuade some of my friends who are interested in that kind of thing to write about the problem of good. Yeah. Um, uh, there's there's something there's something completely um, intellectually suspect about the gross disproportion of attention. Not. Not to trivialize at all right. the human concerns of someone who has had in their life an experience, a loss that forces them just to have that rubbed in their face. I'm not trivializing that at all. I'm talking about the intellectual attention to right. it, the vast libraries on the problem of evil, um, the the you know tiny shelf of things on the on the problem of good. Right. So um, that leads me to. Another observation, which is, I think a lot of times when people talk about the problem of evil, um, what they're really talking about is what you could call the problem of the absurd, that something just doesn't make sense. You know, it just doesn't make sense. There was a story a few years ago, I remember, we lived near Chicago, and there was a story of a woman who was walking along the street, and a window detached. The weather had been very cold, and a window detached came down and decapitated her. You know, wow. and um, uh, that there's something different about an instance like that, and the kind of instances that people often cite when they talk about the problem of evil and they talk about um, genocide. Genocide right. is a favorite. You know, well, <laughs> you know, genocide is terrible. Right. right. Um, uh, but. You know, in, at least in a genocide, you can talk about you can talk about evil perpetrators, and right. and you can uh, probe those kinds of questions. Whereas, there's something about an instance like the woman walking along and being decapitated by the falling window that simply is completely resistant to to any analysis like that. It seems to mock any right. such any such analysis. And to me, what should come out of that is a sense of of uh, of, of humility, um, of of uh, the limits that, on what we can understand, and um, I often think that as Christians, one of our biggest weaknesses is that we don't seem to take seriously the very core of our of our belief, which is the existence and nature of God, and that if if, if this being, and, and I have lots of friends who think that this is just a nutty idea. They, I mean, they think it's a mixture of wish fulfillment, right. sort of childish. And, you know, they know that intelligent people believe it, and they right. kind of rub their heads and say, I don't know how they believe it, but 
they're not all mean and evil and right. it's a kind of a quirk they have. I know lots of people think that. And in a way I can understand why they think it because it is, it's an astonishing, um, it's an astonishing belief. But let's say that it's true. If we really believe that it's true, if we re really believe in the God that we say we believe in, and if we really believe that he revealed himself in these words that were passed down uh, through um, the children of Israel and in the Gospels, and if we really believe that, uh, we're constantly brought up against this reality that is so much larger than, than we can grasp and we're ever going to grasp. And so for me, um, a sense of absurdity should not at all lead you to a kind of smug superiority over, over others so that you can, I don't think we should hesitate to, um, if, we, if we find something um, ridiculous and wrong, as I find, for instance, um, uh, much of uh, the work of George Barna. Uh, and I may be wrong, all right, but I don't think I should go around walking on eggshells. I think I should express that and then move on to something else. But I don't, I don't think we should um, at all indulge in a, in a kind of smug uh, dismissal. Uh, and and, and it's, so, so, so for me, a sense of absurdity doesn't at all um, reinforce uh, um, the kind of yeah. smugness that I think you were warning us rightly against, where we say, oh, well, that's just, that's just clearly the, absurd. Yeah, yeah. And, and on the other hand, um, uh, we 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 very much need, partly for our own sanity, when when we hear and read things that just seem so clearly wrong to us, we need people to say they're wrong. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's it's part of it's part of keeping us sane. And so um, holding that intention uh, is not something that we ever learn how to do once and for all and you know it's easy for the rest of our lives it's something that we have to negotiate every day but yeah let me let me ask about that tension because i think there's a lot there i mean walking between smug dismissals on the one hand and um sort of uh, bold denunciations of those things that we think are wrong yeah that's a uh, a delicate wire to walk on um, Absolutely. with pretty severe uh, falls below. And I wonder, um, how have you managed to do that? I'm, I'm curious. And I also wonder um, what you make of the rhetoric of civility around that, because it seems like within- That's a very good question. Within our, our public discourse, we, um, I mean, we really, it seems like we really love and value civility and we want to preserve um, a kind of niceness to our public square such that, and this is, seems particularly true within the church, mm -hmm. such that even strong denunciations of fellow believers have to be preceded by many paragraphs about how much, about how much we respect them, how uh, we love them, and so on and so forth. And it feels like there's a kind of code that requires a certain kind of niceness before we can come out and say, but I just think you're wrong in the following three ways. Um, at, how, how do we manage that tension? Um, and, and what do you make of civility? Yeah, I, I think that's a wonderful, uh, I think that's a wonderful set of questions. As far as how I have done it, I, that would be for others to say, and I'm sure some of them would say, not very well. So, for instance, I, I can imagine some people hearing me talk about millennials and saying, saying, oh, well, that's exactly what he's doing. He's sounding so smug. He's sounding so superior, uh, you know. And we're just trying to help people. And, of course, this is the old evangelical crutch. It's something that ever since I've been like 10 years old, I've heard people say this. They say things that I honestly think are terribly muddled. And if you try to point out how they're muddled, then they say, but we're helping people. We're, <laughs> we're helping people. And so, you know, I, I would say when someone says, this is something that I've heard literally hundreds of times, millennials value authenticity, you know? <laughs> well, I mean, that is so muddled, you don't even know where to start because in the first place, we all know that being sinners, being weak humans, um, we constantly are tempted 
uh, by what's false for, for, for a variety of reasons. And so there's never been a generation of humans that, um, that, that distinctively uh, values authenticity more than anything else. And yet at the same time, because we're created in God's image, all humans have, have a certain yearning for authenticity, you know? And um, so the idea that, that it's meaningful, and, and probably buried somewhere in that assumption are some, some actual valuable down-to-earth practical observations. If you could just pull them out and make them much uh, narrower yeah. and practical, there's probably some legitimate o observations in there. But this kind of sweeping statement, um, you know, millennials are people who value authenticity. So I would say if, if it comes to things like that, that uh, you happen to be the kind of person that God has created to care about such things and, and, and try to sort them out, you should do that. But you shouldn't puff yourself up with the sense that you're the corrector of all wrongs <laughs> and spend all your time running around uh, thinking that, uh, you know, you're sort of capital letters, the great right. corrector. You know, you have to, and you have to, um, you have to listen. Uh, you have to be a good listener. Uh, you have to learn from others. If you're not learning from people all the time, there's something wrong. You know, if, if you feel like it's always coming from you and you're not learning from others and being corrected by others, that's a, that's a, a real red flag. But the codes around correction that we have are pretty, pretty stringent codes around um, what kind of correction we're willing to offer well, they're and very, accept. They're very, um, they're very inconsistent. So there are certain things at any given moment, like in our cultural moment, there are certain uh, um, uh, taboos, let's say, that if you violate those, it's perfectly all right to be very harsh in correcting. You right. know? And, we, and we could all fill those in. Right. You know? um, uh, then, in fact, you, you run the risk of being criticized for not being fierce enough in your, in your correction because um, by, not, by not being uh, absolutely right. scathing and coming out and saying, I denounce this, I denounce this, uh, someone's going to say, well, why hasn't why hasn't Matt denounced this yet? Where's your courage at? <laughs> you know, where's the outrage? You know, um, on the other hand, uh, if it's not one of those issues where, um, at at our particular cultural moment, and of course every moment has a different set of those, um, if it's not one of those issues, and and uh, you you issue this what seems to you to be justifiable correction. Um, you run the risk of being called abrasive, uncivil, and you know there's no rules. There's no rules for any of that. There's no you can't make a infallible list of of guidelines. I think uh, one thing you can do is look at people who um, who model different virtues and recognize that again God created us in such a way that there there are people who um, seem to be uh, called more to that kind of thing than others. Mm -hmm. And there are people who are um, very valuable because they, they do that. But that doesn't mean they have carte blanche. That doesn't mean that they're never wrong either, and they need people to correct them. Right. So it's very messy. <laughs> Is civility the kind of thing that Christians should be seeking in their discourse uh, on Facebook, on Twitter, on the various places that Christians talk Absolutely, about. Absolutely, but it should be a very robust civility. Yes, I mean, I, I think I think civility, I think civility is is a is a great virtue, and I feel at times that I, I feel at times that I have, uh, I have uh, failed in in observing it as much as as I should, and on the other hand. I think that it can be used, it can be invoked in an unctuous way, it can be invoked in a false way. And so um, we definitely need civility, but it needs to be a robust civility. We often, it, it turns out in practice that civility is a code word for um, being mad about the things that I think you should be mad about and not about some other things that I don't particularly care about. And, and, and when it's used in that way, it's not helpful. So, when you think about 
the rhetoric and the discourse that you hear the most often. You are an editor of yeah. one of America's best magazines. Oh, um, well, thank you. Uh, and it certainly uh, is a unique magazine within the Christian world. It, it has a kind of discourse internal within it that um, seems to be doing something slightly different than most of the things the Christian world has done, at least the evangelical world has done, over the past 30, 40 years. As you think about the kind of discourse that uh, you uh, see more broadly, um, what would be your hopes uh, for how Christians speak about ourselves and speak to the world in the next 30, 40 years? Well, I would say that one thing that should underlie um, everything that we say is a serene confidence, um, which is is very different from uh, is very different from smugness. And I think um, it's something that can be perceived just like a scent, you know. Um, can so, I can, yeah? Can I ask why you added serene to that? Because we hear a lot about confidence, and I've written about confidence, yeah. but serenity is not a word that generally gets attached to it. Well, a lot of, a lot of contemporary evangelical discourse seems to be um, driven uh, by um, a, an unexpressed uh, fear that... Uh, for instance, talk about generational analysis. Um, if we don't do X, the next generation will have only four percent Christians. Right. You know that that kind of thing. Uh, you've written about that very phenomenon right. yourself. Um, it seems to me that that while it's hard for us often to admit how much we can't grasp, we, can, we can't understand. And, and Wendy and I, my wife and I, frequently say to each other, why did this happen? I won't give instances, but you yeah. know, just in the last week, we've had reason to say, why did this happen? We don't understand. We probably never will. That's hard, but um, how wonderful to have a serene confidence that even though we don't understand that, and even though there's much happening uh, that gives cause for sorrow and confusion, um, ultimately uh, all should be well. And so for me the, the serenity is, is, a, is absolutely vital. Uh, that should come out. It's not something like the last thing we want is a campaign where, <laughs> where, we wanna, where we write books, you know, and we give seminars, you know. <laughs> How to have serene confidence. You're not you going to start the John Wilson Road Show? <laughs> no. Or you, you, <laughs> no, I mean, that's the last. I'd go to that. That's the last thing that we, that we want, but it should be, it should be something that, that animates all, all that we do. And I think chill, with, with, with your children, I think that's one of the most important mm -hmm. things uh, uh, as a parent is, is, is communicating that. It's not just what you say, and people say, well, your actions, you know, your speak louder than your words and of course they set up a false dichotomy right. and you know all of that matters but um, but animating what you say and what you do should be this um, this beautiful serene confidence that should be the the foundation so what else though I so I really want to prod you because I, I I like hearing the John Wilson prescriptive uh, <laughs> because we don't get a lot of John Wilson prescriptiveness about the world we get um, uh, you know John Wilson as editor speaking uh, editorially and we love the John Wilson book recommendations but you know we do have within the evangelical world a great need for people who have um, observed it for a long time to offer wisdom about how we speak now, the kind of virtues that we need and how, how we need to grow as a church in our speaking and in our public presentation. So serene confidence is, is about the most beautiful phrase that I, I think I've heard and I'm going to work really hard to not uh, <laughs> <laughs> sloganize it. Well, you know, I'm. But I want more. I'm, I'm a lot more encouraged um, about the state of things than a lot than many of my 
friends are, and maybe that's just skewed, you know. May, and may, maybe it has something to do with my temperament. I, you know, I don't know. But, but I've I've been telling a number of people that you know one of the joys of my job is, is encountering a lot of young writers, and I I love the writers like like Mark Knoll and Nick Wolterstorff who've been guides to me for for much of my intellectual life. But it's also a special joy to see. Um, new writers, young writers coming along, and they're not part of any movement. Uh, they don't add up to some kind of uh, a platform, but, um, but they exhibit different ways of, uh, of being Christian, of being the body of Christ, and I just find that wonderfully encouraging. optimistic than your peers and many of us about the state of things. Um, In some ways, I mean, I think the world has always been a, a, a place that's full of joy and sorrow and of laughter and of horror. And it's true that there are certain places and times, uh, you know, Germany and in uh, the Nazi era and other times when uh, there seems to be um, a kind of concentrated darkness that is overwhelming, but but the sad fact is that um, there are always a lot of terrible things going on, right. and um, uh, sometimes we're complicit in them without uh, hardly being aware of it, and um, so it's not like I want to walk around saying uh, everything just keeps getting better and better right. but um, but on the other hand um, I I honestly don't see our contemporary situation quite quite the way that a lot of my dear friends do why do you think that the declinist narrative if we can call it that the, the narrative that the world is getting worse um, why do you think it has a resonance for many of your peers? Why do you think it is such an easy story to tell? Um, and again, you know, what kind of virtues do you think that we lack, or, or excuse me, and, and that we can culti- cultivate within ourselves in order to have a more realistic assessment of the state of things, if you're right? Well, I think that it, there, there are always um, these temptations. Uh, there's also the opposite temptation towards the kind of utopian thinking that you right. find from someone like Ray Kurzweil, let's say. Right. That has a tremendous appeal as, as well. And I'm not so inclined, um, I'm not saying that, it, that we should never psychologize in that way, but I'm not so inclined to uh, spend time thinking about, you know, why do you believe that? I would rather just talk to you about why it seems to me to be not an adequate, hmm. um, not an adequate description of the common reality that we share. Not, not completely wrong, but too partial, too one-sided. I'd rather talk to you about that than, than presume to figure out why you hold this view that I think is wrong. Yeah. With one of the categories that we hear a lot within Christian discourse is that of engagement. We need to engage culture. We need to, um, you know, engage the world around us. Uh, we've started to hear some discourse from some corners of Christendom lately about a kind of withdrawal. Rod Dreher has written about the Benedict Option, a, a kind of detachment from uh, society and so on. I'm just interested to hear your take in light of um, sort of everything that we've talked about, the kind of virtues that we need to have. Um, how should Christians think about um, how we should live now? Is it a posture of sort of leaning in and engaging? Is it a posture of potentially withdrawing from our broader discourse? Or are those categories just uh, the wrong way to think about this, and if so, how should we? I would say first, and this 
probably isn't a very exciting answer that some will be called to engage and some will be called to withdraw and the engagement will take many different forms but I'd also say um, I think the person in my life who um, in many respects seems to me the most engaged is a person who never never uses the word culture would never read these um, discussions that you and I are both interested in and I'm not I mean yeah. I, I love these kinds of discussions but but um, and that would be my wife uh, Wendy and so she's engaged for instance uh, like she was a hospice volunteer for hmm. um, many years and and now she's doing uh, part-time home health care and you know she has gone and uh, made lunch once a week for a woman in her 90s and sung hymns with her and mm. um, you know th that's not um, the kind of engagement that a lot of people are thinking of when they use the term engagement which includes right. political yeah. engagement and other things which I think can be part of what we're called to do but it's not like that neither is it what most people think of when they think of withdrawal right. you know um, uh, but uh, and it's not something that is particularly exciting you know it's it's um, it's very uh, mundane um, but it's also beautiful and so I think um, uh, I'm humbled I'm humbled by that example and I think well at least I'm earning a paycheck <laughs> <laughs> makes it possible for <laughs> Wendy to <laughs> to do those kinds of things and and uh, you know hopefully um, you know I'm contributing to that but but there's so much there's so much that goes on that escapes the categories that we use when we talk for instance of the option to engage or the the option to to withdraw um, uh, let's just say that um, there's never a shortage of uh, good ways that we can live out that serene confidence that you and I were talking mm -hmm. about earlier. We're never going to um, we're never going to run out of, of good things to to do. Well, John, I'd I'd have to say that you're doing much more than earning a paycheck so that your wife can do the good work that she's <laughs> well, doing. Hope. Maybe a little, I hope. Uh, much more than that. You're a gift to the church. You have just the kind of serene confidence which, um, Lord knows, uh, we need a lot more of. And I'm really grateful for that, and, and grateful for the work you've done at Books and Culture, as, as I think many people are. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you.